the book of Ephesians is where we've been. And I'm not going to reiterate things that I've already talked about a lot, but we have talked about the fact that Ephesians is, is divided up in half. It's six chapters long. The first three chapters uh, really talk to us and speak to us about the theology of Christ and about who we are in Christ, uh, our standing uh, in, in Christ, and so uh, our, our riches that we have been given in Christ. And so we find out who we are in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. And then the final three chapters, the chapters 4, 5, and 6 in the book of Ephesians, tells us how we are to live as a result of who we are. I don't know if you've ever had parents. I was raised in a pastor's home, so I obviously have parents like this. But it's like, listen, boy, you don't do that. You know why? Because you're my son. And you don't do that. That's not what the Cox family does. You ever had anybody like that? That's just not what we do as a family. You know, and it's like, it's tr- the truth is, who we are in Christ and what, have, what we have received in Christ, now it's how can we walk. And so in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, we're going to learn how to be a better husband, how to be a better father, how to be a better wife, how to be a better employer, employee. We're going to learn all those things. By the way, we push this really close together, and uh, every time I step on it, it sounds like it's going to fall through. I don't think it's going to, but if it does, you'll, you all will know. And so uh, John knows a little bit about it falling through, but anyway. For those of you who haven't attended Keystone for probably six months, this has been about six months ago, John, he was back here, uh, and he has this little stool, and he used, he used to be in the middle, and there was a little opening about like that, and his stool found that opening. And so he was playing, there's video of this, you don't have it, do you? Man, uh, sorry. Um, there's video of this, he's just going to town, as John can do, and he's going to town on there, and then all of a sudden it's like, boom, and he's gone. Like... It's down, but here's the cool part. He picks himself up and he starts playing while he's standing up. He's just like, it was awesome. But it was funny because like the, it messed up the lights. The lights went everywhere. It was, it was a great day. And so uh, anyway, back to Ephesians. That's where we were. And so that's where we're going to be. Ephesians chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. And the title of today's message is simply this. I hope you get it. I hope you get it. If there are any teachers in the audience today, I think, or you have taught at any time, you understand that you have a truth, you have prepared for that truth, and you're ready to deliver that truth to your students, and your prayer is, I really hope you get it. Um, If you're a parent in this room, and you've had that conversation with your son or with your daughter, and your, your prayer inside of your heart is, I really hope you get it. I hope that what is going into your, your head is, is finding its way to your heart and is going to become who you are. And how many of you understand it's not necessarily just enough to teach something. You have not really taught something until they have understood it. I mean, we've all had boring professors. And you can sit up there and talk and spew your mouth all you want to. But if I haven't learned it, then you haven't really taught it. And so Paul, in these verses, verses 15 through 23, is basically praying to God and he documents his prayer. He's praying for the Ephesian Christians. And he is in a nutshell saying, I really hope you understood the last three sermons in this series. I really hope you understood verses 3 through 14. We're not going to take the time to read them. If this is your first time here today, I would encourage you later on, or you can do it now, whatever. uh, But go back and read verses 3 through 14. It talks about God who chose us. It talks about Jesus who redeemed us. It talks about the Holy Spirit who seals us. And there's a lot of deep theology in those verses. And Paul is basically saying here in verse 15 through verse 23, I hope you understand what you just read. I hope you get it. Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 says this, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened or opened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints 
And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under His feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all. And all, Heavenly Father, speak through your word today. God, I pray that you would remove any distractions that could cause us to not focus on your word. God, I pray that today I would not say one word that you would not have me say. God, that everything that is spoken today would be 100% from you. God, I pray that we would leave here today having got it with a better understanding of what you want us to know. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for loving us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. In in verses 3 through 14, we found, and we spent three weeks on that. I took the first week, Steve took the second week, and then I came back on the third week, and we talked about the Ephesian Christians. Paul was talking to them about God the Father, about God the Son, and about God the Holy Spirit. It's almost as if in verses 3 through 14, Paul was talking to the Ephesians about the Father. And it's almost as if in verses 15 through 23, Paul is talking to the Father about the Ephesians. He says, listen, uh, Ephesian Christians, I want you to know something about your God. And then it's like in verses 15 through 23, he says, God, I really want the Ephesians to really know you. I really want them to understand who you are. And, and by way of just principle this morning, we ought to always talk to people about the Lord. And we ought always to talk to the Lord about people. This is going to annoy the mess out of me, guys. I'm just telling you right now, but we're going to keep rolling. Uh, we should always talk to people about the Lord. And we should always talk to the Lord about people. You know where we get in, in, in trouble? What do we do? Can we be honest? You know what we do? We talk to people about people. We talk to people about people. And we ought to do as Paul does here from verses 3 all the way through into this chapter. He talks to God about the people and he talks to the people about God. And we ought to make it a a, a principle that we are going to live by that we're going to talk about people to the Lord. And we're going to talk about the Lord to people. And I'm going to do as very little if, if zero talking to people about people. How many of you understand in the, in the technology day and age we live, in the social media day and age we live, we're grown adults and we've got feelings like middle schoolers. Like, did you see what she posted? And it's like, who cares? Like, if you don't want to see it, don't, like, unfollow them. Like, one of the best things I ever did for my spirit on social media, it, I don't care who it is. If you affect my spirit in a negative way, you get unfollowed. That's just, that is the way it is. And on Facebook, they don't even know it. So you're still friends with them, but you unfollowed them. You ain't got to see all their negativity. So just FYI, that's just my little social media um, uh, spiel for the day. Uh, On other social media things, you have to actually unfollow them. But I'm like, you know what? If you're affecting my spirit in a negative way, boop, see you later. But you know what? We find so much people talking about people, but Paul talks to God about the people and talks to the people about God. And as Paul f- finishes verse 14 and moves into verse 15, wherefore I also, wherefore is a transitional word in scripture, meaning that verse 15 through 23, they don't stand alone. They refer back to what was just said. So we're relating the, the previous verses into this passage, wherefore I also. Paul wants them to understand. He wants them to comprehend what he said in the previous verse is, I hope you get it, he says. And this morning, I think as your pastor, uh, for those of you that are here for the first time, as a pastor, um, my pray- if I could pray one prayer to God for people, it would be, I hope that they get it. And that is not coming from an arrogant place. That is not coming from a place of me saying, I got it. I hope you get it. That's not an arrogant statement on my my part at all. 
It is just that God has so many rich truths that He wants to bestow on His children and on His people. And I really hope that we grasp it and we understand it and we figure it out. Just like a parent to a graduating high school senior that's about to leave home for the first time. You know, let's go out, let me take you out to eat. Let's go on a little vacation. Let me have that father-daughter talk as you embark, right? I hope you get it. And that is what Paul is saying here. The, the danger in a Christian that attends Keystone Church that doesn't get it and doesn't understand the, the, the verses that we've been preaching about is that you will find yourself struggling with a legalistic, performance-driven Christianity for the rest of your life. If I don't perform at this level for God, then somehow God is going to turn away from me and make my relationship with Him so difficult. And I'm going to have to search and search and search and search for Him. And the danger is if we don't comprehend the theology of the first three chapters of the book of, of Ephesians is that we are going to turn into just a legalistic Christian that wakes up and checks off your to-do list. I've read my Bible today, check. I, I did my prayer list, and my prayer list has a bunch of check marks too. I prayed for my country, my president. I prayed for my local politicians. I prayed for my uncle and my aunt and my nephew and my niece. And we're just going to go through the motions on that. And we're just going to check everything off. That's a danger if we don't comprehend what we are and who we are in the theology of Ephesians chapter 1. If you don't understand how rich you are in Christ, then you will constantly find yourself beating yourself up for not doing enough, for not living up, for not being enough. And Jesus offers you so much more, and that's what we're going to talk about today. This prayer that Paul prays for the people. First, I want you to see this. He prays a prayer of thanksgiving. A prayer of thanksgiving, and, and by way of introduction to this, by the way, this is, there's going to be three points to this message, three main points. This is not a bad prayer outline for us in general. The model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, gives us kind of a prayer outline as well. This is also not a bad prayer outline for us to adopt in our own personal prayer time. But he, he prays a prayer of thanksgiving for them. Verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul was thankful for the Ephesian Christians. And let me say this, we ought to be thankful for other Christians. Paul was thankful and grateful for them. And let me just say this as your pastor, I am so thankful and grateful for the people of Keystone Church. I was standing out, out, out uh, in the back before we started today, and I was thinking, it wasn't four or five months ago that I was standing back there going, man, I hope there are people like when we got there to worship, I hope there's enough people to where we're not singing to an empty. I really just I'll shoot straight with you. There were some Sundays. In fact, there was a Sunday back in January that I wasn't sure if I was going to be preaching to anyone. I thought that maybe we were going to have about three rows. OK, let me say this. I am super grateful and thankful for every single person that calls us home or has that ever that has ever attended our church. A prayer of thanksgiving. And I pray those prayers over you often. Thanking you. Every time I run past something that you, know, that you maybe post online or every time I, you shoot a text message to myself or my wife, every time you come into our lives or our minds are, 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 um, are awakened to you, we pray and thank God for you. What did Paul pray in his prayer of thanksgiving? He thanked God, number one, for their authentic faith. Wherefore, I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Their authentic faith. He thanked God for their real faith. And let me say this, a church would not be a true church without people inside, sitting in these pews, sitting in circles, serving, that have a real, genuine faith in Christ. And let me say this, if you don't have a real, genuine, authentic faith in Christ, I want to invite you into that today. I, I, I want you to understand that you can have a real, authentic faith in Christ, but Paul thanks God for their authentic faith faith. And, and if Paul was writing a letter to Keystone Church today, I pray that he could thank God for our authentic faith. Not for our Sunday morning faith. You understand the difference, right? We got a lot of people around this world that have Sunday morning faith. Everything's good to go. But they get in their car at 12 o'clock and everything reverts back. And we become, we do what we call compartmentalizing. 
Men especially are bad at this. Good, bad, however you want to look at it. We're professionals at this. We are in our Jesus box, and then we remove ourselves from our Jesus box, and now we're at work. And who we are at work and who we are with Jesus are two different people. And we get off work, and we have to go home and say, okay, oh, wait a minute, I'm not Jesus Josh right now. I'm not work Josh right now. Okay, I'm Father, I'm Father Josh. I'm, a, I'm, dad, I'm dad Josh, and I am husband Josh. Okay, let me compartmentalize that because I'm different now. And then, oh, I'm going to go to a football game, so now I'm football Josh, and now I'm going to go golfing. I'm golf Josh. Wait, you might want to stay away from that one. Uh, or I'm going I'm to go, now I'm on vacation Josh. Oh, you know what, every now and then, you know what, i got to get back to Jesus, Josh. Let's be honest. If we're not careful, we have our quiet time with Jesus, and we have our time with Him, and we say, oh, man, that was really good. And we really do. We enjoy it. We have our time with Him. Oh, man, that was really good. And we go. And we walk. And we sit it down, and we walk. And what I pray for today is, a, is an authentic faith, the faith that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ, 24-7, 365. But not only did he thank God for their authentic faith, but he thanked them, thanked God for the love that they had for all the saints. The love that they have, he said that, that wherefore I also after hearing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love unto all the saints. And let me say this, may we always be a church that has love for all of the saints. Not just the saints that look like you. Not just the saints that act like you. Not just the saints that, are, that you're comfortable around. May we have love for every single person, for all people. It doesn't matter what their bank account is. It doesn't matter their needs. It doesn't matter their past. It doesn't matter what they're wearing. It doesn't matter uh, what, what you think about them. May we have love for all people. All people. It's been a couple of different times since, we've, since our church has started. Um, there's been some families that, that have come to visit, and they've actually reached out to me. And they say, hey, listen, we have a family member that is this or that has this or that fill in the blank. Are they welcome? And my answer 100 times out of 100 is everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. Hey, listen, the church is a hospital. Man, that person's sick. Get them to church. That's a sick lifestyle they're living. Get them to church. Get them to the hospital. What kind of person are you that sees a sick, pers a sick person and doesn't take them to the hospital? So you work with a bunch of spiritually sick people? Get them to the hospital. Get them to the hospital. May we have love for all people so that whoever walks through those doors right there every Sunday morning, it does not matter who they are. It does not matter their past. It does not matter how they look. It doesn't matter if they're dressed in their Sunday best or if they're dressed like they, they slept outside last night. It does not matter. When they walk in that door, they get a hug. They get a handshake. They get love. May we have love for all people. No matter their struggle, no matter how they look, no matter how they act, no matter how they make us feel. May we have love. The easy, the difficult, the rich, the poor, the struggling, the hopeless. You know why? Hey, we love you. We love you. The first time you walked through that door, we loved you. So guess what? Now the bigger we, the next time someone walks through that door, we love them. The same way you were loved when you first showed up. We love them. We love them. We love people. All people, it does not matter. He prays a prayer of thanksgiving over the Christians in the, uh, in the, in the city of, Eph of Ephesus and the surrounding areas. A prayer of thanksgiving. But secondly, he prays a prayer of intercession. A prayer of intercession. Look at verse 17 if you have your Bibles or you can uh, look on the screen. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ... The Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His, of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. This is where the rubber meets the road here. Paul says, hey, I pray 
that you have understanding. I pray that you know. I pray that you get it. He prays for a spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of God. As your pastor today, I simply want you to know God. That's what I want you to know. Theology. God. I want you to know your Heavenly Father. I want you to know your Heavenly Father the way some of you never knew your earthly father. Can we just get down where we live? I want you to know your Heavenly Father better than you know your earthly father, if you had a good relationship with one. I want you to know your Heavenly Father. The first phone call you make when you have problems, I don't want it to be on your cell phone. I want it to be on this phone call right here. I want you to know your Heavenly Father. Just to know God, to possess godly wisdom. Colossians 1.9, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will, God's will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. To know God. Listen, we know God only the same way we know people here on this earth, and that is by spending time with them. It is by seeking them out. It is by, it is by going out of our way to develop a relationship with them. Knowing God. Paul prays that they would just have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. How well do you know Him? The one that created you, the one that loves you, the one that knows every hair on your head. For some of you, that's easier than others. For some of you, I know the number of hairs on your head. Zero. Anyway, uh, but uh, the one who loves you, the one who knows you, the one who created you, just the way you are, with all your flaws, with your positives, with your negatives, do you know that God? I pray this morning, as Paul prayed, that we would just have an understanding of the knowledge of God. But he doesn't stop there. He says, a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. But then he says, for enlightened hearts, uh, for enlightened hearts, that, you're, that your eyes could be opened, your eyes of your understanding being enlightened. We want to have enlightened eyes and enlightened hearts. This is a comprehension of godly things. Enlightened hearts, that means, when, uh, the word enlightened means that once they were closed and now they see. So he says, I want you to understand who you are in Christ. I want you to understand your riches that you have been given uh, in, in Christ. Uh, he wants us to know uh, the hope of his calling and the riches of, of the glory of his inheritance. That's what he wants us to know. He basically says this, I want you to comprehend that you have already been given so much. I want you to comprehend that you have already apprehended. Let me tell you this, Christian, you are rich in Christ. He has given you riches. He has given you everything in Jesus. You are rich in Christ this morning. You're rich. And all I want you to do today is open your eyes and realize it. The story is told of a factory worker in the state of Indiana. Um, in fact, if, after I get done telling this, if you, I've got the article. Um, I can shoot it to you if you'd like to see it. It's pretty cool. Factory worker in the state of Indiana, and he, um, he bought just kind of a cheap house, and there was a hole in one of the walls. And so this, he didn't make much money, and so he figured out the, how much it would cost for him to repair that and replace the, the, the messed up portion of the wall. And he said, you know what, I think I could just go buy like a picture and I could put the picture over top of it, and nobody will ever know. How many of you, that's the way you work on your house? Don't lie. What? Oh, come on now. How many of you, that's the way you work on your house? Oh, there we go. Come on. There we go. Okay. There we go. But have an altar call now for lying. I'm about to change my sermon. I'm going to come to all of y'all's houses and start taking stuff off the wall, see what's behind it. But this, this, this man, he said, you know, I think I can just go to like a secondhand shop, and I can buy, you know, a picture and throw it up there. No problem. So he goes to the second-hand shop, and he buys, he just finds a picture, sure that'll work, and some other odds and ends stuff. I think 
the, the, I think he said the total amount that he spent that day buying several things for his house was $30. So he bought all this stuff for his house. And he was able to take that painting, or that picture, and he put it up over that hole in the wall, and it stayed there in his, uh, in his, in his nice, you know, uh, small, tiny little house there that he had. He started playing a game called Masterpiece. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of that game before. Uh, it's kind of a, like an 80s, 90s game. But, and and I'm, not, I'm not geeking out on this stuff. But evidently, uh, there would be famous art pieces, and then you would match who the artist was. I, would be, I don't think I'd be good at that at all. But uh, anyway, I'm not much. I, I know it's shocking to you guys, but I'm not much of the artist type. But, uh, but he was playing that game. And he notices a piece of art in that game, and it wasn't the piece that he had in his house, but he's like, that's, like, that's pretty similar to this junky you know, painting that I put up over the hole in the wall. And so he starts to do some research. And he finds out that the painting that he bought at a secondhand shop somewhere in Indiana, rural Indiana, uh, was actually a painting by a man named Martin Johnson Head. I don't know if that means anything to anyone. It didn't mean anything to me when I first read it. But now I know. If I run across one, I'm picking it up. <laughs> a painting by a man named Martin Johnson Head. And so he starts looking and he's like, okay, this could be from him. So he takes pictures. He sends, to a, uh, sends some pictures that he took of his painting um, off to an art center in New York City. And they reply back with, sir, if this is authentic... I don't think you understand what you have. Not only do you have a Martin Johnson head piece, but you have his most expensive piece that he ever painted. And they get him in touch with the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas, and they work out a deal for this man who probably paid, if it was $30 for everything, let's just say he paid $10 for a painting at a secondhand shop. They buy his Martin Johnson head painting for $1.25 million dollars you know what the reality of this factory worker in indiana was for a while there he was rich he didn't even know it he was rich but his riches were like on a wall over there covering up a hole you know what as christians sometimes i feel like i know we're rich we are rich Read verses 13, 3 through 14. We're rich in Christ. We are rich. But sometimes I think it's like, okay, it's over there in the dining room. It's covering up a hole in my life. Sure. We're rich, and we don't even know it. He was a millionaire, and he was working a factory job, and he was trying to make ends meet paycheck to paycheck. Didn't even realize he was a millionaire. You know what, can I say spiritually? I feel like spiritually, we're sometimes living paycheck to paycheck. Let's put it down, we're living like Sunday to Sunday. God, okay. I get on a high on Sunday, and it's like, here's my week. And okay, I get pretty low, and okay, now I'm back to Sunday. I got it. Now I'm, this will sustain me. And man, if I miss a Sunday, it's like, oh my goodness. And we live paycheck to paycheck. And we don't understand that we have a Savior who loves us so much that we are eternally rich. We're eternally rich as if we are already seated in heavenly places. We are eternally rich in Jesus Christ. We are eternally rich, and we don't even comprehend it. And Paul prays that we would simply comprehend our riches. Not only does he pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, he prays for enlightened hearts, for us to comprehend godly things. He prays for us to comprehend the hope of the riches of our inheritance, our future in heaven. That we would understand our future. And we've gone over this a couple of different times in the book of Ephesians, for good reason. That we would understand that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That, that as we leave this earth, we are immediately in His presence. To understand our riches and our inheritance. Hey, let me tell you something. What we have in heaven compared to what we could have in hell, we are rich. We are rich. That we would understand a spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. 
to have enlightened hearts, to comprehend godly things, to understand our future in heaven, the hope of the riches of our inheritance. And then that we would understand and comprehend the greatness of God's power. Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe? The greatness of God's power. Could we just understand this morning that God has the power to heal our sickness? That God has the power to resurrect a dead relationship? That God has the power to do anything that He wants to do just with His voice? Psalm 90 verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth uh, and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We serve a powerful God today. Of Psalm 33, 8 and 9, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. We serve a powerful God today. There are many illustrations I could give you this morning that I won't, but we serve a powerful God who simply said, let there be light. And there was light. We serve a God who can command demons to flee from a person's body and they run. We serve a God who can go out as we are experiencing the coming in of a, of a, a large hurricane possibly to our area that could walk out into the Atlantic Ocean and just say, peace be still. If he was in 2018, he'd be like, chill, bro. All right, that's what he would say. <laughs> chill. That he can walk out and say, chill, bro. And it would cease. And the meteorologist would go, well, that's not what I thought was going to happen. And I have no idea why this thing just stopped. And there's no explanation for what happened. We serve a God with that kind of power. We serve a God with the power to heal your bodies. We serve a God with the power to do anything that he wants to do. And this morning, Paul prayed, can we just understand how powerful our God is? Hey, can we understand that God has the power, Don, to do anything he wants to in Don's wife's life? He can heal her body right now. He can heal her body right now. He can do anything he wants. As Sammy sits in a hospital room this morning and, and in pain and recovery, God can do anything he wants. We serve a powerful God this morning. And I don't think we believe it. And I don't think we have the faith. And I don't, because we don't have that mustard seed faith. I don't think we have it. I think our prayers are oftentimes, God, we pray that you would do this, but I, and it, we don't say this, but we really think, but I know you're probably not. So let me figure out an easy way to say something else that kind of gives you the out. God, would you please, God, would you change the life of my, my daughter or my adult son or my adult daughter that's, that's gone away from you? God, would you change it? Now, God, I know they're really tough and they're really lost cause and all. So whatever you do is fine. That's the way we pray. And no, I want to pray as the Bible says, God, if it be your will, you can do whatever you want, God. And if it be your will, may I selfishly pray that you change the life of my fill in the blank. God, that you come to them when they need it most and your Holy Spirit smacks them in the face and they don't know what hit them and may they be arrested by your presence like Saul was when he was on the Damascus Road and his name was changed to Paul. But we don't believe that. It's like we don't really believe in the power of God. Oh, that was just Bible stories. Oh, that's just... Oh, okay. Look, Josh, chill. You're not Pentecostal, right? And I'm not, but I love the Holy Spirit. And I think God can do whatever in the world he wants to do. And I love when he does it, when none of us Baptists or whatever you claim to be can explain it. I love those. Because we're like, oh, 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 we start stuttering and stammering and we don't know what to say. I love those. When we start stuttering and stammering like that, the Pentecostals think we're speaking in tongues. It, we're confusing everybody. We don't even know what's going on. But you know what the truth is? We serve a powerful God. He can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it. And Paul says, I pray you just understand it. Just comprehend it. I don't care what what seems so lost in your life this morning. God has the power to change it. I don't care who it is in your life today that you think can't be changed. God has the power to change them. We serve a powerful God. 
This morning we've seen a praise of, I mean, a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of intercession, and I gave away the third one. Thirdly, we're going to see a prayer of praise. A prayer of praise. Verse 19 ends with his mighty power. So that's what we're talking about, his mighty power. Verse 20, his mighty power which he wrought in Christ. In Christ, that's that's the name of our entire study, the book of Ephesians. Which he wrought in Christ, his power. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that also which is to come, hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He finishes this prayer with a little bit of a, I like to call it a praise break. If y'all know what a praise break is, just go on YouTube and put in praise break and you'll see some people getting with it in Jesus' name. All right, but he has a praise break. It's basically where everything else stops. He just praises God a little bit and doesn't care. He doesn't worry about what anybody else is saying and thinking or, 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 or thinking about him at the moment. He has a praise break. I like to take those every now and then. Kind of scares my wife and kids sometimes, but I do it anyway. I've been known in my praise breaks, if I'm driving the car, the horn will beep along with, with whatever, I'm, whatever I'm praising the Lord about. You know, it is what it is. So if you're ever beside me and you catch me doing that, it's all good. You know, I'm not lying. Uh, but uh, he has a prayer of praise. You know what he does? He praises God in this prayer. And he says, listen, I just want to praise you. Number one, for your resurrection power. Hey, listen, Jesus Christ, our living hope. Is that what we're closing with? All right, good. Man, praise the Lord. Our living hope. Our living hope. The resurrection power of Christ. If Christ is not risen from the dead, then you will not rise from the dead either. If Christ is not risen from the dead, then you have a false Christianity. If Christ is not risen from the dead this morning, then everything we've just talked about for the last 25 minutes doesn't really matter if Christ is not risen from the dead. And he praises him for his resurrection power. And we ought to do the same thing. God, not only did Jesus come and die on the cross, and not only was he buried in the grave, but he rose from the grave. And listen, I mean... Can, we, can I be for real? Can I be for real with you for just a second? This is not, I'm not being sacrilegious at all. Any of us could go down a cross. Physically, we can go. We could do it this afternoon. We could go and set up a cross and we could die physically on a cross. Guess what? People could take our bodies off that cross and they could put our bodies in a tomb. Anybody can do that. What makes Jesus Jesus? There's two things. Number one is that he lived a sinless life. He was a virgin. Well, there's a lot more. Sorry, not more than two. He was born of a virgin. He lived in sinless, all that stuff. But what, what in, in the gospel, what makes Jesus Jesus? That he rose from the dead. That he was dead for three days. And that he rose from the dead. Man, we ought to praise him for his resurrection power this morning. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And he is. His resurrection power, we praise him for that. But not only that, he praised him that he is ruling in power he set him at his right hand in the heavenly places he's above principalities he's above powers he's above might he's above dominion he is above every name that is named in this world and the world to come god has put everything under the feet of jesus and he has given jesus to be the head over all things to the church amen amen we serve a risen savior and we serve a ruling savior we serve a risen Savior and a ruling Savior. You say, Josh, this is a little bit theological, whatever. That's fine. We need it. We need to understand that we serve a risen Savior and we serve a Savior who rules and reigns. I think this all points back to His power. Man, literally all things are under His feet, meaning He can walk on top of it. I think it's a pretty good prayer outline this morning when we pray to begin with a prayer of thanksgiving. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you've given me. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being my Lord. Thank you for being my master. Thank you for being my leader. Thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving me my family. Thank you for giving me my kids. Thank you for fill in the blank. To begin with a prayer of thanksgiving. And then I think it's a very good thing to move into a prayer of intercession. And that word, by the way, is simply when we are coming to the Father on behalf of someone or something to intercede. By the way, Jesus has done that for us as well. But as we intercede on behalf of 
Sammy. God, I come to you today not for me. God, I come to you for Sammy, for your young child. God, who's going through, who went through this surgery. God, I intercede on his behalf as if he's here, but I'm praying for you, for him, to you, for him. We ought to be steadily interceding for people within our church family. We ought to be steadily interceding for people that are outside of the walls of our church. We ought to be steadily interceding. Listen, if, if Don Zweck's name doesn't come off your lips in prayer on a consistent basis, then we ought to repent this morning. Right? We ought to repent this morning. A prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of intercession, and then we ought to move into prayer of praise. Listen, if, you, if, you, if your praise is broken, something's not right. Something's not right. The last two Sundays, if you could be here at this church and you couldn't, your praise couldn't, you start not you know, feeling something rolling inside of you and it's not your stomach, <laughs> feel something rolling inside of you. If you could come to the last two Sundays and I've not experienced that, listen, Thanksgiving, intercession, praise. Thanksgiving, intercession, and praise. Could that be how God wants us to pray? Hey, it actually follows the Lord's Prayer to a certain degree, a little bit more generic than the Lord's Prayer. If you claim Jesus Christ is your Savior this morning, if you would say, Josh, I have received Christ, I know that I'm saved, heaven is my home, I know that. If you claim Jesus Christ as your Savior, then I want you to know something. You have ultimate riches in Christ. You have Jesus, and He has all you need. You have the love of the Father. You have the redemption of Jesus Christ the Son. And you have the security of God the Holy Spirit. You have everything that you need. And this morning, I just pray that you get it. That you understand it. And that you comprehend it. That Jesus is everything. I pray this morning that no one is sitting in their house with a $1.25 million, $1 million Martin Johnson head painting, living paycheck to paycheck. I pray this morning we're not rich and have no idea. Have no idea. I guess if I could give you a three-word conclusion, it would be this, simply realize your riches. Realize your riches. And they are, it's not money. It's not fame. It's not any, it's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Rich in him. I just hope you get it.